Well, my grant proposal is to use iron torrent technology to uh, sequence the genomes of bacteria, and specifically bacteria that cause disease in hospitals. So what we want to do is we want to take isolates, clinical isolates, from the hospital and sequence them uh, using iron torrent technology so that we can very rapidly and cost-effectively get an idea of how bacteria are spreading within the hospital. Um, we can look at new isolates as they arise and we can say, have we seen this before? Is this a strain that we've seen in this hospital? Is it something we know? Or is it something totally new that's just arrived here? Um, we can make decisions about how the bacteria are spreading. Are they spreading from one patient to another? from patient in bed A to patient in bed B to patient in bed C? Or does it look as if there's other kinds of transmission going on? Maybe they're carried around by staff members or they're contaminating the environment in the hospital. So we might see a strain arising in a patient that we, it, when we haven't seen that strain for some time. Um, and then we think, well, hang on, that's the last patient to have that strain was actually in the same bed, so maybe the ward environment is contaminated. Uh, so that's what we hope to do. We hope to really drill down and get detailed uh, information about the spread of pathogens in the hospital. Well, the impact of pathogens on patients is varied. In some cases, these pathogens actually cause serious infection in a patient. They prolong their stay in hospital. They make them iller than they were before. In some cases, I mean, it's not common, but in some cases, they actually can kill the patient. On top of that, some patients get colonized with these pathogens, but don't actually get an infection themselves, but they present, then present a risk to other patients. And we have to take special measures to isolate them, try and decontaminate them. And this has a negative impact on the patient as well. So there's no doubt that these pathogens are creating enormous problems uh, in hospitals and impacting on the well-being, health, uh, and so on of the patient in hospital. So currently the pathogen that we're focusing on is an organism called Acinetobacter baumannii. This is a particular problem because it's often multi-drug resistant. In fact, it's of all the bacteria that we see in hospitals, this is one closest to coming to a situation where we have no antibiotics that work anymore. Um, it spreads from patient to patient in hospitals. There's been a particular association with military personnel uh, returning from the uh, conflicts in Iraq and more lately in Afghanistan bringing this pathogen back into hospitals and then it's spreading um, to other patients within the hospital. So that's been our current focus. We have funding, three years funding, to actually look in detail at the uh, population structure of that pathogen across the country, across the world, um, and also to focus in on what's going on in our own hospital in terms of the outbreaks. Typically with this pathogen you'll see an outbreak that will involve half a dozen or a few dozen patients smolder on for a few weeks or months and then it will disappear. You get a few months where you don't see the organism around and then it will reappear again and you'll get the same kind of thing. That's our experience in Birmingham. In some hospitals, I know uh, colleagues in London say that they actually never see it go away, it smolders on all the time. Um, but what we need to know is how is it actually transmitted around the, the hospital and that's what we want to focus on. We've done some preliminary work on this. We took uh, six uh, isolates of this organism from one particular ward and we looked at them in detail, we genome sequenced them and we showed that by recovering the entire genome sequence of all of those pathogens we could actually make inferences about the spread. We could say where, where the pathogen had gone from one patient to another. Um, and the hope is in the future that we, will, with this very fine-grained view of the, the pathogen's epidemiology, we'll be able to tailor our interventions appropriately. Now, at the moment, there are methods for typing uh, Acinetobacter baumannii, uh, but the, the setup usually involves sending the isolates away to a reference laboratory. 
Uh, the reference laboratory then batches them up um, and uses fairly onerous methods to actually get some limited genomic information from the, the pathogens and then sends that back to the hospital and says to the hospital, yes, all your isolates are the same as far as we can tell, or in fact you've got two different kinds of uh, strain in your hospital or whatever. But that process typically takes weeks, sometimes even months. Uh, what we need, obviously, is a system where we can say, oh, we've got six new isolates on this ward, or we've got ten new isolates on this ward, and we can genome sequence them within a day or two and go back and say, actually, this is a new outbreak, this is a new strain, we've never seen it before, we need to get on top of this, or, oh, this is just another occurrence of that same old pathogen that we've seen on our wards for the last few years, or, or this is the appearance, say, in the renal unit of something we've seen in the liver unit, but we've never seen it in the renal unit before, but it is the same as what we're seeing in the liver unit, so somehow it's spread from one unit to another. That's the hope that we can actually get down to that fine-grained epidemiology. The other issue is that even with the best reference methods at the moment, you're basically grouping isolates into, yes, they're the same, or they're indistinguishable by the, this method, or... Um, they are clearly distinct. But the things that appear indistinguishable, it may well be, and we have good evidence to suggest that if we sequence the whole genome, we can get down inside the, the population structure and get real detailed information about how they're spreading, how they're evolving over time, um, and, and actually get a much better view than what is even the, 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 what's currently available. So, you know, we're not just getting things more quickly, but we're getting more information, more detailed information, uh, and that will help guide uh, the interventions. I mean, the resources for infection control are finite. You know, there's infection control nurses, there's, there's doctors involved, but they have finite resources and they have a finite amount of time. So if we know exactly what's going on, we can then tailor the interventions to, to suit that. So how do we know these pathogens are out there? Well, most of the time we get the first hint of something going on because people are taking clinical specimens because there's a clinical indication. So a patient may have a, w a wound, a surgical wound. It doesn't need to be healing very well, or it may actually look infected. They'll take a sample. A uh, patient might spike a, a, a temperature, and they take blood cultures. So those specimens that have been taken because there's a clear clinical reason sometimes yield these hospital pathogens and alert us to the fact, oh, there's something going on here which is, is not so good. When people realize that there is a, an ongoing problem, that they have an outbreak, then they may become um, more uh, aggressive in actually seeking out the pathogen. They might engage in what we might call enhanced surveillance. So they might actually start taking specimens from patients just to see if this particular pathogen is there. Um, there are some pathogens where, in fact, that routine surveillance is now kicking in, particularly in the UK, things like MRSA. Screening is coming in even if the patient doesn't appear ill. They'll take specimens to see if they're carrying MRSA. I mean, one of the, the key problems is that not every patient that gets colonized with one of these organisms gets infected. So for every patient that, say, gets an illness with MRSA, there'll be 10 other patients who get colonized with MRSA or carry it on their skin, carry it in their hair, in their, on the scalp, in their nose, in their armpit or whatever, but they won't be suffering any symptoms. And it probably isn't presenting them a, a particular problem, but they represent a risk to others. And for the sake of the one that's going to get infection, we have to then deal with those other 10 in terms of isolating them, decontaminating them, and so on. We're very fortunate in Birmingham uh, in that we have the university campus and the hospital right next to one another. We've got a brand spanking new hospital on the campus. It's five minutes walk from the hospital down to our genomics lab in, in the School of Biosciences. We have good working relationships with the medical microbiologists. I, myself, I have a medical microbiology training. I'm a medic qualified as a specialist in medical microbiology. But over the last uh, 10, 15 years, I've tracked a course towards academic pursuits and uh, research and teaching. 
but we have maintained these good working relations with the, the people up in the hospital. And so what we're anticipating doing is that if um, someone on the wards says, look, we've got a problem here, we've got something interesting here, we've got, an, we've got a cluster of six mm -hmm. acinetobacters, we uh, want you to look at them, they can give us the isolates, we can take them across the campus, we can extract DNA from the, from the bacteria, you know, after an overnight culture, and then we can genome sequence them. And uh, the promise of IonTorrent is that we'll be able to do that genome sequencing within a day um, and get the results back, you know, from the first inkling that there's a problem to having the results may only be two, three days. Um, and then we can actually say, oh, this is uh, what's going on. This is the intervention that you should be adopting. This is the way it's looking. We have a more ambitious plan, which is uh, we, we've just set up uh, with, uh, or just in the process of setting up with funding from the National Institute of Health Research in the UK, a new centre in Birmingham, uh, which is going to be called a Centre for Surgical Reconstruction and Microbiology, which will focus on trauma patients. Uh, so it will focus on military patients who've had their leg blown off by an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan, or it might focus on road traffic uh, uh, accident victims and what we're hoping to do there is actually genome sequence everything that comes out of those patients every significant bacterial pathogen that comes out of soft tissues or of the blood of those patients um, and again the promise of iron torrent is that we won't have to batch things up and wait long periods of time we can just get on and do that as things emerge get results within a few days We're in a situation at the moment where we, we have proof of principle that whole genome sequencing works for these kind of applications. But the current uh, technologies that are out there are either too expensive or just too unwieldy in terms of the workflow and the time and so forth to be useful. Um, and, and that's where the excitement of iron time comes in, that we can actually get on and do these things, but do it quickly and relatively cheaply. Um, one problem is you, it, we don't want to have to batch up 200 isolates before we can actually do a sequencing run. You could do that with the current technologies and you could get good results and you could probably get very cost effective results but you'd have to wait a long time before you actually did the experiment. With the iron torrent if we can do genomes in twos or threes or dozens and get same day results that will be fantastic. So when we're talking about current technologies, we've got uh, a variety of approaches. Typically in a reference laboratory, they'll have different approaches for different bacteria. So for one organism, they may adopt one approach. They may have pulse field gel electrophoresis, or they might have multi-locus sequence typing, or uh, variable tandem length repeat typing. But those will all be customised for the particular organism. So what works for Staph aureus won't work for Acinetobacter baumannii, won't work for E. coli, won't work for Pseudomonas necessarily. One of the great advantages of genome sequencing is that it's a one-size-fits-all technology. You can extract the DNA, you genome sequence it, and you can apply similar kind of analytical pipelines to, to analyse the data to get the same uh, kind of results in different settings. There may be some differences. Some, some bacteria will evolve more quickly than others. But in general, the hope is that we can move towards a one-size-fits-all approach uh, and just accept that sequencing DNA is all that we have to do. The problem with the current approaches are, as I mentioned before, sending stuff off to a reference laboratory means delays means things get batched up as well. That means more delays. Um, we have been doing work in the research arena using high throughput sequencing to see if, if these approaches, just to see, get proof of principle. We're not the only ones. There are groups in Oxford, the groups in Cambridge doing the same sorts of things. I have a group in, in Vancouver that are having a paper coming out looking at these kind of approaches with, with tuberculosis. But at the moment, those are very much research approaches where you are going to what's in the freezer 
for the most part, and getting a collection that's been collected over a long period of time, a historical collection. Um, and well, those technologies are expensive as well. We're talking thousands of pounds, uh, maybe even more than £10,000 uh, in, in some instances, just to do one experiment. What we, we really need is, is the flexibility to get on and do these things in real time and to do it at a, at a price which is uh, close to what we're used to paying for diagnostic uh, uh, tests in, in, in a clinical setting. Tens of pounds, hundreds of pounds, hundreds of pounds at most. I mean, at the moment we're talking probably hundreds of pounds, so we're probably at an order of ten lower than the existing technologies, but if Moore's law does kick in with this technology, and within another year or two we're tenfold cheaper, then, you know, if it really does cost ten pounds to sequence a bacterial genome, then this technology reaches a tipping point. And that brings me on to a, a more ambitious goal, which is that not just for typing and, and epidemiology, but we could be using this technology for diagnosis. So that rather than grow bacteria, look down the microscope at them, look at them on agar plates. And let's be frank, those technologies are 19th century technologies. They were developed at the time of Koch and Pasteur. And we're still using them over 100 years later. The subversive thought, it's subversive at the moment, but we'll see how it plays out, is that actually we just sequence the DNA that comes from patients and we'll be able to find bacterial DNA in there, we'll be able to identify the bacteria, we'll be able to characterize them, type them, work out their epidemiology, work out their resistances, all from sequencing the DNA. And if that is coming in at a few tens of pounds, then that becomes the technology of the future. There are some caveats, you know. There are, to use the Rumfeldism, we worry about the unknown unknowns that we might have discovered if we grew the bacteria but we wouldn't see in the genome. But the flip side is that you see things in the genome that you'll never see just by looking at the microscope down there, the, looking at the bacterium down a microscope. So, you know, there's a brave new world out there. In five to ten years' time, I think we're going to see a transformation of microbiology, of clinical microbiology, through these techniques. My dream would be that we would sequence an outbreak in the summer, um, you know, we maybe have a dozen genomes and we have our first publication with this technology. Uh, it'd be great to be the first people to get an iron torrent paper out on bacteria. Um, I don't know how many others are struggling to get there, um, but that, that will be the, one of the, the first goals. If things go well, it's research, you can't prejudge the outcome, but if things go well and an iron torrent really does uh, match up to the existing technologies and turns out to be cheaper and quicker, and my assumption is it will, then we'll stop using those technologies and we'll do everything by iron torrent because it, it will be the best, most effective use of the taxpayers' money to get the research results.